made that film, helped bring the last two days' work, sessions, the research we've heard together. And we've seen two videos which have really done a lot, I think, for our conceptually to help us see what integration, how it can really impact the women's lives, how it affects our communities. And in particular, what we were thinking of putting together our, our video, we really wanted, we would have really liked to take all 350 of you to Nyanza province and see the work that the Ministry of Health, Kenry, and UCSF are doing. But obviously that would be very difficult unless we were to stay for a few more days. So my closing comments, uh, this has really been a momentous occasion. It represents a huge amount of work. I'm going to be thanking those who have been working on different committees, including the Secretariat, uh, specifically for the work that's been done for over about 15 months. It's an idea that's conceived about 15 months ago by meeting uh, the Bill and the Gates Foundation with Monica Kerrigan and Renee Ritson, who agreed to support the idea of this conference. We total 349 participants. We thought, as some of you know, we were still waiting for your bags. We thought there were 277 of you. We were gladly and so we were surprised that an additional about 80 people showed up. Just fantastic. It shows some interest and sincere commitment, your commitment, to uh, integration of reproductive health and social services. We represent 30 countries. I'll be showing you a map in a moment to see where we all come from. With the help of donors, including the Bill and Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, the Office of AIDS Research at NIH, and also the Center for AIDS Research, also supported by NIH, we were able to provide 114 scholarships, including researchers, people from ministries of health, implementers, advocates, and journalists. The presentations have included 59 oral presentations. These include both individual and panel presentations, which you've all been uh, taking part in. 44 oral poster presentations, that include both individual and panel panels. And the next door, as you know, we have poster presentations available for you to interact with additional uh, individuals conducting really groundbreaking research with your 20 posters. In all, we have over 100, about 170 abstract submissions. We would have liked to have been able to accept them all. Obviously, we went through a peer review process and chose the ones that were the most meritorious. This conference is not over. Uh, this is the closing ceremony. There's not time tomorrow, being Friday, we want to let people go early. That's the reason why we're having a closing ceremony today. About a little more than 100 of you are going to be staying for their registered for day three. If others of you want to stay for day three, you can talk to the Secretariat and we can arrange for that as well. So there will be two parallel sessions tomorrow. First one is Advancing Program and Reproductive Health into Integration. The session chairs are Dr. Isaac Bashir from Division of Reproductive Health, Margaret Vital from NASCOP, Dr. Rose Wilcher from MHI 360, and Dr. Michael Mizo from the World Health Organization. That's going to be the Ivory Room, and I'll explain what the Ivory Room is in a moment. The other parallel session is on the future research agenda, if you will, and reproductive health into integration. Session chairs are Dr. William Minor from NASCOP, Dr. Marciana Nuno from Kemring, myself, and Charlotte Warren from the Population Council. That will be in the vote reel room. That's in the other room where the parallel sessions have been occurring. The ivory room is right across the way from that. So now we know where the ivory room is. So we're going to be very close together. And that's by design because for the morning, we're going to be separate in our separate groups the research group and the policy and programming group separate and having discussions and advancing uh, the agenda for that day. Then we're going to have lunch together by design. And then following lunch, we're going to reconvene together as one group and have report backs. Because as we know, and as we've heard today, we need to, to overuse the word integrate, we need to ensure that the policymakers and the people implementing, the people who are working on programming, are working very closely with the researchers and vice versa. Without that, the need of the research does not actually have an impact on programming, and we have to we then also have the programming that's not well informed by research. So taking that into account, the organizers decided that we're going to be coming back in the afternoon, and we uh, promised to have you uh, out by 3.30 tomorrow, and I need to go home at early. Um, also, I just want to challenge some of you. Uh, tomorrow, I don't, we, uh, the organizers, it's not 
so I'm one of the organizers. Uh, we don't just want researchers in the research room. Some of you researchers go over and spend time and go over, spend a day in the program uh, room. And for the MOH people, the program people, the policy people, we want you in the research room. We want to create that crosstalk during the morning hours. So please, I'm challenging you. Okay, back to where, the, where you all come from. As I mentioned, we come from 30 different countries. We, this conference targets specifically the countries in the subcontinent with the highest prevalence of HIV and also the high total fertility rates. Obviously, that doesn't represent all of your health as we've heard at this conference, but it serves as a proxy for a tremendous amount of unmet need. And you come from the countries where it matters most, and where it's greatest unmet need, and where integration has the potential to make a difference. In addition, there were some of you that, that decided to come from other countries. The US, the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Belgium. In addition, some came from Asia, Afghanistan, Nepal, and Pakistan. Thank you also for coming and sharing your ideas here at this conference. We look forward to hearing back from you as you take the lessons you've learned here back to your countries, back to your regions as well. And we do want to encourage networking and on the website, we will be working, we're working on, we have a Facebook site and Twitter and other ways to be able to reconnect the people that are here uh, today. <clears throat> Before I get to the thinking part, which is really the most important uh, part of this closing uh, comments from my perspective, I just want to make a few key points. <clears throat> I also want to thank the rapporteurs for helping me to put together uh, these two points. So I'll just be briefly talking about the importance of integration, models of integration, the human rights approach, which we've heard about, for example, in phase plenary, measurement and evaluation, also in today's plenary, and making integration a reality. And to do that, I thought it would be kind of fun to make, what would be some, what would be some uh, uh, highlights that we're going, or, uh, sorry, this word, um, like newspaper headlines. What would we want the headlines, what would the headlines read? If you were to come up with five headlines, it'd be interesting to have each of you write these down. What would be your five headlines that would come from this conference? <clears throat> and share those amongst others. Obviously, there would be a lot of overlap, but there would also be some distinct areas. And I think we need to be cognizant of the areas where we overlap and strengthen those areas, but also the minority views are also very, very important if we were to really be innovative and really provide the services that are required by women. So the first one I came up with is, integration works, but it's not a panacea. We saw evidence over the last two days that some pretty good evidence that integration, family plan integration of the HIV, between care and treatment integrated into the antenatal care setting, cervical cancer screening, <clears throat> it seems to work, or at least not cause harm in many cases. But there are challenges. It's not a panacea. <clears throat> it's not we're not going to reach all the unmet need. Does this meet the needs of women and men if we just focus on integration? We need to go beyond integration. For example, stigma. We've seen it time and time again in these presentations. Where it was measured, stigma mitigates the impact of any potential benefit of integration. We saw that today in regards to women who were pregnant, who were for the first time discovering their HIV positive, not in care, trying to get care. Those who felt internal stigma, those who had stigma from an intimate partner, or from the community were less likely to take up services. We still have, although there's lots of data, and we've seen there have been reviews on this as well, on integration, there's still few data demonstrating impact on what we would consider outcomes. What are these outcomes? For family planning integration, we would be looking at pregnancy. Constructive uptake is a proxy for pregnancy. <clears throat> but in the study that we presented yesterday, while we saw an increase in more effective use, more effective contraception, we did not see a significant change in pregnancy. For antenatal care, we want to see reduction in HIV care. We want to see a true reduction of <clears throat> HIV transmission, vertical transmission, eventually leading to its elimination. We have the technology to eliminate mother and child transmission of HIV. Why are we not doing it? How can integration help? How can we go beyond integration to reach 
that goal. And lastly, this area, obviously this list is not uh, <coughs> exclusive, but there are many other uh, bullets beyond that. We do not have much cost-effectiveness data. The Integra program has done an excellent job of developing the expertise and the models to be able to look at cost-effectiveness. And then we also, in the planning study, have done, done the same. We did not do it for the other study. And many researchers are not, have not so far looked at cost-effectiveness. It's not so easy to do because you need to have data on effectiveness. You need to measure cost, which is also not easy to do, but you need to have the effectiveness. How can we do this better? Because these are the data that can really affect policymakers, ministries of health, ministries of finance, which are making the decisions that affect the people who are trying to help. So my second headline, one model doesn't fit all. It's obvious. We've heard so many different approaches. Even within one panel, or one session, or between sessions, we've heard about, in the first plenary, uh, we heard about the supermarket approach. One facility, room to room, linked, and that approach may be what's advisable in some settings. The two videos we've seen talked about a in one place, or one stop shop. We've heard that terminology over and over again. We need to further explore these models and find what help ministries of health and other partners determine what works best in their setting. It's obvious that one model is not at all. For example, do we integrate, I mean, I think the answer to this one is pretty easy, do we integrate HP services into family planning with good health services? Or do we integrate good health services into HIV? Of course, we should be doing both. And I'm really glad to see that in the research that's been presented here, the models that have been presented, we have heard experiences and results from both. We really need to incorporate the needs of the community, the women and men that we are working with. We need to hear their views. We need to know if they're satisfied with the services that they are receiving. In addition, the providers form part of that community. And so I really encourage us all as we go back to our country, back to our work, how can we do a better job, even though students are doing a good job, how can we do a better job to reach and meet the needs of the community? Okay. My third headline. I did not create a new word. Okay, I made it. Maybe didn't. <laughs> about an hour ago. Human. I challenge us to think about our own gendered perspectives. And I see myself when I say that. Our own stigma related with gender, being a woman, being a man, our perspectives. In hearing that being in many of the sessions during the last two days, I've heard individuals give very stereotypical, or have very stereotypical questions coming from their perspective. I want to challenge us all to think about our own perspectives and how it affects our views of our work. It's fine to have our biases, but how do we bring those biases to our work? Can we go beyond that? Society changes. Values change. We need to move towards a client-centered care and high quality of the health and care. This is a right, for example. It's now in the new Kennedy Constitution. It's probably in other constitutions in Africa as well. I challenge us to work with the ministries, with the members of the parliament, with people on the ground to make sure they know their rights. We need to partner. It should just be the health disciplines working together. We need to partner with the legal profession and other elements of society to move this agenda forward. As we heard very passionately today, it's, uh, during the plenary, the <coughs> plenary given by Kevin, but also heard in several of the sessions, these rights extend to other key to all to everyone, including key populations, men who have sex with men, sex workers, drug users, HIV supporting couples, and migrants. We had very few discussions so far on migrants. This is a very large population. Typically, when we talk about the HIV epidemic, we're talking about men, gold miners, truck drivers. But I would challenge you that actually women are more common to be migrants in Africa than men. Are we meeting their needs? If not, how can we meet their needs? They're migrating for many different reasons. Many of them economic. How can we meet their needs? As 
Dean was speaking about uh, today in this plenary about measurement. I thought gave an excellent presentation. And I think this is the old adage, what gets measured gets done, or gets done well. If it doesn't get measured, it likely, uh, likely gets done. So we have a need for an index of integration, and there are tools out there. The question is, are they being used? Are the Ministry of Health requiring that they're used? Are they requiring? We, as the founding director of FACES, I know, that we, every three months we have to provide numbers back to the Ministry of Health and to the to PEPFAR, to the CDC PEPFAR, the FACES program. We don't have integration on there as measurement. We don't even have, for mostly, we don't have reproductive health outcomes on there as well, in the family planning. Why not? Why not? It happens to be because the donors, like PEPFAR, have not acquired it. PEPFAR came out of the Bush era. I would argue that it's probably the best, in my perspective, the best thing that our last president did. But why not family planning? Why not have family planning be central to PEPFAR? It's part of the PMCT, but beyond. It's your health, it's required by women and men. Importance of documenting and sharing information. This conference is a start, and it's part of a process. That other conferences on integration, the two that I'm aware of, I'm sure there have been others, have been in Washington, D.C. We obviously, as covered organizers, had the patents conference has to happen in Southern Africa. We're trying to meet the needs of women and men here. Not that women and men in other regions of the world don't have to be on that hit, they do. But unfortunately, the health outcomes on this continent are some of the worst in the world. We should be ashamed of where they're at. But we should also be hopeful of where we can go. And we can do we can provide the evidence that informs the policy. We can do, we can actually obtain design studies that actually help us to get the highest level of evidence which has a better chance of informing policy and making a difference. And research, as a researcher, I've learned the lesson. We need to work hand in hand with ministers of health, other partners, CBOs, NGOs that are on the ground, and importantly, the mentioned earlier, the local community, if we want our research Truly make its have its intended make its intended difference to improve re reproductive health and aging services. My last headline. This is one I would hope for. We're not quite here. 2012 integration became a reality. What would it take for this for integration of reproductive health and aging services to become a reality? What would it take? Here are just a few ideas. <clears throat> So we really need leadership that's been heard over and over and over again. The community, the regional, the national levels. Advocates need to stand up. Community leaders need to stand up. These ideas of integration need to be included into the national plans and into those budgets. I've seen leadership at the facility level make a difference. In the same district, one facility hasn't had implants, comes up with implants for three months while one facility does. They're getting from the same source. Why is that? I think it has a lot to do with the leadership of that facility. How can we incur, how can we ensure that the leadership is uniform, the systems are in place, and those commodities are available to women and men who need them? Country leaders need to take ownership. Kenya has done a fabulous job. This process of integration is led by the Ministry of Health by the task force that was formed in 2002, jointly by the National Aid SC Control Program and by the Division of Reproductive Health. Our program only has worked because we worked hand in hand with them from the very beginning of designing the program, designing the intervention, working in their clinics side by side, informing each other along the way. And importantly, you think about why has integration not taken place? What have been some limitations? And I would say that while donors are a very important constituency when it comes to integration, there have also been a hindrance. You heard in the video very passionately by the member of parliament in the video, who also appears to be a doctor. There are different requirements by the donors. How can we get these donors at a meeting like this to talk together and not allow the, <coughs> the, these separate programs to exist? How do we encourage integration 
to happen. And unfortunately, I don't, and I'm not an expert in the Global Health Initiative under the Obama administration, but I'm underwhelmed by what I've seen. I'm underwhelmed, and we should be. And if there are people here from the U.S. government, listen to me, I'm underwhelmed. The global support we've got in regards to that part, I don't know if I can say this much. So, I challenge you to do better. I challenge us to do better. Now I get to my favorite parts. <laughs> I want to thank so many people that have made this conference and are making this conference reality. First, I want to thank our keynote speaker, Michael Gizmo, who's right here. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. He's also going to be co-chairing the session uh, tomorrow uh, on policy and programs. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Shulam Acharya from USAID Kenya, David Plenary, Dr. Lepshi Akello from the Ministry of Health in Swaziland, Kevin Osborne and Nasty this morning. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for your presentation. It's challenging us to do better. This conference would not have taken place. I, with the financial support alone, it was impossible. The steering committee led the process. The steering committee, I'm not going to read all the members here. But many of you are here, in the, some of you are here in this room. If you're here from the steering committee, can you please stand up? I really appreciate it. So you can watch it. Steering committee members? Too shy or not here? <laughs> uh, so, well, anyway, we thank you in absentia. <clears throat> this group, the steering committee, met regularly over the past nine months uh, and really take all the credit for making this conference. Oops, wrong direction. Okay. Scientific Committee. This was a group that worked day and night to put together the program. And if you're here with the steering committee, can you stand up? Wow. Yay! <laughs> I'm on the scientific committee as well, so I can stand up. Although my name's on the scene, right? I actually was able to meet with them several times. And really, I think we put together a fabulous program. So thanks to the scientific committee. And the Logistics and Publicity Committee put together so much of the aspects of the conference. And you're not seeing behind, but we have fabulous support on media relations. Uh, we know that IDBF has been a big, but an essential role, leading a workshop on Monday and Tuesday, bringing together journalists from across the continent, including Kenya. So if you hear from the Logistics and Publicity Committee, can you stand up? Okay, session chairs, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. But we've had a lot of you, we've asked a lot of you from across institutions, across countries, to lead these sessions and without their leadership, these panels and the individual sessions have not been such a success. So thank you very, very much. And I'll show you from here's kind of continuation of the individuals who gave your time and your support to the conference. So thank you so much. This gets emotional here because the Conference Secretariat uh, has worked so hard. The Secretariat is housed jointly between the Kennedy Medical Research Institute and the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, they've been working over the last 15 months to make sure this conference took place. They're still working hard to ensure success. Um, <clears throat> and they've literally been working 24 hours a day for the last at least three months many of whom are going to be going on a slight holiday or a holiday, extremely well deserved. So these people are going to ask to stand up. I know some of, you, some of them are not out here, but I really want you to stand up. And we'll, let's hold your applause until everyone stands up. So Mariciana Nono, unfortunately, she could not be here today, but she has been the engine for this, one of the major engines for this conference. Uh, Dr. Kakusi, Alyssa Kakusi, many of you know, the Deputy Director of Research and Training at Kemri would have liked to have been here, but unfortunately, very unfortunately, the other people did not be here during the conference. So Mariciana has been taking the lead and working tirelessly. Evelyn Bhatti, Evelyn, I want you to stand up. Uh, all right, she's here, so maybe she's working out. Okay, Emma Kituku? Okay. <laughs> Rachel Steinfeld. Nina <laughs> Bellar, she might be she might be 
Priscilla here at the council of women. And Kyle Musateri, also part of our group at UCSF, part of the Nixie Center for Global and Reproductive Health, who is at home helping you to finish the grant inside the last minute of the come. So let's. Thanks so much to the Secretary. Oops. Uh, in regards to media, we had lots of support that I mentioned earlier. Florence Machio, is she here? Uh, so, as you've probably seen, we've been on KBC, KTN, uh, radio, television, many of the uh, news reporters from the various news agencies here in Kenya, and across the continent, Florence has done a fabulous job. Had two rapid tours, uh, Yambure Githongo and Wendy and uh, Lundi.